There we go. All right. Okay. We're good to go. Okay. Take two. Well, I will back up 10 seconds and we'll start fresh. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our discussion today between Green Fire and Fenway Health. Um, I'm going to just get started here with a few quick housekeeping items uh, before we dive into the, uh, the background and the introductions. Uh, next slide, please. First and foremost, we will be recording this webinar today, and everyone's going to get a link to the recording immediately following the event. Uh, number two, please feel free to submit questions at any time today during the discussion. Towards the end of the presentation today, our presenters will try to get through as many questions as they can during the uh, Q&A session, so uh, please feel free to fire questions in through the chat at any time. And finally, uh, please connect with us. We'd love to hear from you and, and network a little bit, so please take advantage of LinkedIn or anything else and, uh, and reach out and try to connect. Um, next slide, please. So my name is Kyle Cunningham and I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Greenfire. Um, for any of you who are not familiar with Greenfire, we are a technology solution provider that really aims to help get qualified treatments to market more quickly by focusing on ways to make trials more convenient for patients and then in parallel by really doing what we can to reduce administrative burden for research sites so that they can focus more on what really matters, which is the patients and the patient care and the clinical research itself. Now, I've been overseeing innovation at Greenfire for the last 10 years, and really my team's primary job is to understand the pain points of patients, research clinics, and other relevant stakeholders uh, within the spectrum of clinical trials, and then in turn really do what we can to find ways to solve those problems. But really, it's our entire company that works together to fulfill that overall mission. And in fact, our employee values are really all about everyone functioning all in as a team and solving problems for a purpose. And when we say all in a green fire, we really mean all in in every sense of that phrase. In fact, we've named our diversity committee all in to really recognize and celebrate the diverse backgrounds of all of our employees but we also say all in when we think about our solutions and we work every day to make sure that everyone, no matter who you are or where they are, have access to clinical trials. In fact, our all in committee has worked to bring attention to the need for increased representation in clinical trials through such examples as our work with black women in clinical research, um, Latinos in clinical research, and even more recently, our Light My Fire Women's Empowerment event. But today, we're tackling issues that are just as equally as important, and we'll be discussing access to healthcare and clinical trials for those who identify as part of the LGBTQIA community. And we wanted to do more than just make our social media avatars rainbows for Pride Month, but also have a meaningful and constructive conversation. Next slide, please. So today I'll be joined by my colleagues, Jaleesa King and Josh McBoy from Greenfire, and Tamor Khan and Sarah Gunda from Fenway Health. Now, Fenway is one of the original community health centers in the United States, which focuses exclusively on meeting the healthcare needs of the LGBTQIA community. And we're really proud that they're a client of Greenfire and appreciate their utilization of ClinCar, which is our patient-focused reimbursement solution. But before we get the interactive panel discussion started, I'm just gonna have each presenter uh, quickly introduce themselves. And we should start with the Green Fire folks. So uh, Jaleesa, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you. We're so excited to have you at this event. My name is Jaleesa King, and I am a senior data analyst here at, senior data delivery analyst here at Green Fire. And I'm also a co-chair of the All In Diversity Committee. So we're so excited to host this event and to raise awareness and to bring light to an issue that has a large impact within clinical trials. Thanks, Jaleesa. Uh, Josh? Good afternoon, all. My name is Joshua McBoy. I'm a CEO Partner Manager 2 here at Greenfire. Uh, excited to have you all on a call today um, and uh, excited to and looking forward to some of the questions that may come from it. Thanks, Josh. And uh, for the Fenway folks, Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Genda. I am the receptionist and staff assistant at the Fenway Institute. Um, and so I am mainly in charge of doing all the clean card consultations and everything like that. I'm just so excited to be here to share my experience. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Tamar, before I ask you to introduce yourself, I'll just again uh, echo an earlier comment. 
um, for the audience, please, I encourage you to chat in your questions at any time for the presenters. Uh, we'll try to get to them uh, towards the end of the presentation and discussion today. And just again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm excited to be part of it and I'm looking really forward to the uh, discussion. Tamor, over to you. Thanks, Kyle. Hi, my name is Tamor Khan. I use he series pronouns and I'm uh, currently the Associate Medical Research Director for the Fenway Institute. But at Fenway, the organization, I also am a provider, a primary care doctor, as well as an infectious disease specialist. Um, before we get to the next slide, just a little background on myself. I born and raised in Boston. Um, parents are from Pakistan and I went off to med school in New Orleans at Tulane, got my master's in public health and my MD degree, did residency and a chief here in internal medicine in Ohio. And then I was back in Boston for an infectious disease fellowship, which was from what, 2017 to 2019. And I joined Fenway in 2019. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so I included this uh, giant infograph <laughs> that includes some very basic information about Fenway Health. Um, we are a 501c, FQHC, which stands for Federally Qualified Healthcare Setting, um, which means we do get a lot of funding from the government to subsidize some of the care we provide. And just to, a little correction for Kyle, we're not exclusively LGBTQIA+, we do also provide care to anyone else that has mass health or Obamacare that requires healthcare that couldn't get it anywhere that only takes private insurance. So we will see everyone, but yes, correct. Uh, historically, we were one of the first centers that kind of focus their research and work on the LGBTQIA plus community. And just so we have all our letter soup, alphabet soup kind of on the same page, that acronym of the shorthand stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, and then plus, because some of the language keeps changing. We wanted to be inclusive rather than exclusive when having that label set up. And our mission is, as stated on the slide, to enhance the well-being of that community, as well as the people in our neighborhoods through access to the best healthcare possible, possible education, research, and advocacy. Now you see four squares there in the center. Those are kind of like the branches of Fenway Health. They are like some of our biggest um, departments and groups. So you've got Fenway Health, which is medical. That includes the pharmacy, optometry, that includes dental, that includes mental health and behavioral um, departments as well. The Fenway Institute came about by Ken Mayer um, and some, a couple of his colleagues back in the early 80s when there was a need to do advocacy work and research specifically around HIV. Um, Ken was one of the first people in uh, New England, was the first person in New England to diagnose the first case of HIV then. And there was a lot of stigma and a lot of fear around working up those patients, especially in the outcare outpatient setting. And so he really was an advocate for collecting specimens. And the more data we collected, the more we learned there was a need for also having an IRB, an internal review board for all the data and stuff we were collecting to keep patients safe and participants safe. So we did a lot of work in HIV care, but then what happened as an offset of that was like, all right, we're getting this information. We are the, the mouthpiece for this community. What else? And from that came a lot of training and advocacy work. And so within TFI, there are departments that do a lot of policy work on the government level, as well as setting some guidelines for national um, like medical community as well. So we write the guidelines for the trans health along with WPATH um, for providing gender affirming care for our trans patients, as well as HIV and PrEP care. So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, meaning that for people that are at risk for acquiring HIV, the infection, there's a medication, there's what we call a chemo prophylaxis or a medication you can take to prevent getting that. Um, and we were also kind of the forefront initially in HIV treatment as well. So over the past few decades, there's been a lot of advancement in HIV prevention and treatment. So we've got these treatments and preventions that are really effective and really safe. And now the question is, how do we get it out there? And part of getting medications and new therapies and preventive measures out there is what we call implementation science. So implementation science is essentially after the science and the, the, the kind of the efficacy reporting of things, how do we get it to be ubiquitous in the population? How do people start using it, start learning about it? And what are the barriers to that? And the barriers to that aren't as simple as running a test and seeing how much 
drug you have in your system. It is learning about social determinants of health. It is learning about stigma. It is learning about mental health. It is learning about drug use. It is learning about housing inequities and the list goes on. And so we have within TFI several different departments. One of them is an epidemiology team. Their role is essentially to look at the needs of the, the community, which is how Fenway started. It was a community-based organization and figuring out who are these people in our community, how, what it, how many people identify as being black, marginalized, having issues with mental health or being neurodivergent, like all these questions come into play and that's what the EPI team does. The data team uh, works on kind of pulling that information together and helping providers, researchers, grant writers, et cetera, use our own community information that we're getting from the EPI team and formulating that into grants, into policy work. And as mentioned, we've got policy. So they take the numbers we get from data and EPI and kind of bring those to stakeholders, including like Congress and NGOs and for-profit organizations. So that's kind of like those three branches. Then what we've got is the, the department within TFI that I started off working in and have been spending most of my time in, and that is um, the biomed team. So the biomed team works uh, primarily with any kind of clinical trials that require enrolling and follow-up for. There are three buckets that we kind of look at this as. So there's the large network clinical trials, which are usually funded as a lump sum from the NIH. Um, and so those include studies specifically looking at PrEP um, and prevention of HIV, both medications and vaccine work, because we are doing vaccine work in HIV as well. And because of most of the most recent outbreak, well, second to most recent outbreak, COVID, we've also become one of the COVID research sites. So we did a, we were part of the AstraZeneca clinical trial, and we also did a Regeneron study as well. Excuse a little, a few other little things here and there. Um, now we're dipping our toes into monkeypox because that is a need of our specific community in Boston specifically. We have, at Fenway, we have half the number of cases that Boston has seen here, but just in our, at our clinic. Um, so that is kind of large network studies. The next batch of studies are pharmacy-driven studies. So that's gonna be uh, the studies we're right now doing where we have a, a Gilead study, we've got a GSK study, um, who else, Merck and Vive. These are all people that we've currently or recently been working with. And the last batch of studies we have here at Biomed are um, clinician driven or investigator driven. So we get local uh, doctors and faculty that really want to enroll a certain population in a study. And I'll give you an example. We've got a young gentleman, Peter Kai. He's a doctor at MGH. He does emergency medicine. And he also has one foot in the door with MIT creating some new technologies. And one of those is called the, the digital pill, a digi pill. Essentially, it's an RF transponder attached to a tablet so that when someone ingests a pill, they can kind of see when they had it. And so we can document adherence to medications. And he's also investigating kind of like the long-term implications of that data. Like who sees that? Is that for the patient? Is that for insurance? Is that for the doctor? Is that for the partner? Who is that for? Because specifically his work right now is around looking at HIV treatment and prevention tablets. And so that's kind of like the work we do. Oh, and there's one more department that I forgot to mention. It's called BSRP, which is Behavioral Science Research. Um, and I think those are our main ones. The other two logos you see there, which is the light blue, is the Borum. That is our adolescent clinic, which um, it has a separate site located in downtown Boston, which sees um, our teenage and adolescent patients. And they provide anonymous testing for HIV. And the last one is AIDS Action. And that came about through uh, initially, it was uh, a branch of Fenway Health and became its own entity. Now it's become part of Fenway Health again, but essentially they do a lot of outreach advocacy work for people living with HIV. Boom, 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 boom. The last thing that I forgot to mention is the Ed Center. So we are Fenway Health. We are unique. We have this ability to take all these things, which include trans health, HIV prevention, advocacy work, data, epi, EMR creation, et cetera. But it's so unrealistic for us to like multiply Fenway Health in every city that we created an ed center. So what we do is we basically provide packaged sessions, seminars, trainings for any community health clinic in the nation and beyond. And so we have these sessions that last about six months. We're currently in the middle of our trans health one, which I'm faculty on. Um, and we meet with about 60 different clinics and we train them over weeks and months on how to provide this care to their patients. 
So we are really proactive about getting our wealth of knowledge out there. We do not have a monopoly on it. We try not to. Well, we are we are amazingly lucky that things worked out the way they did. So we have this wealth of knowledge and experience. And we try to disseminate that to the best of our ability. Um, in the past, I've also been part of a prep echoes we call them echoes because we kind of repeat the same messaging in different ways over and over again and a lot of these community clinics can also bring very specific patient cases to us as an expert panel to help them solve them so uh trans health trans echo there is a prep echo we had one during COVID about telemedicine and providing care to patients in the middle of the pandemic um there are a few others that i'm forgetting we also have large seminars and conventions that happen around each of these which are nationally attended so that is kind of the background on Fenway. As you can see from the image, we are located right across the street from Fenway Park, but we do have at least four different sites that are worth mentioning. One is the main building you see right there. There's another one, the Borum, which is located downtown. My clinic is actually in the South End Medical Clinic. It's a smaller community-based clinic. And then we've got a few other uh, sites, including Green Street, which is actually as part of Department of Health. Uh, a safe needle exchange access site as well, where my counterpart, Julia Fleming, she does hepatitis C treatment there as part of Department of Health. So again, we look at the needs of our community and we kind of create programs that kind of facilitate and address those needs. Um, I've included my email there, link to our main website, as well as if there's anyone's interested in that um, echo information, those seminars, there's a link to the, the Ed Center's website there as well. And with that, I'm gonna give this to Sarah and advance to the next slide. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, we use ClinCard across all our studies, all our teams, all our locations. And because of the usability of the, the program, I could do that from 1340 Boylston, which is huge. Um, it's been, just a pleasure using it and working with your customer service team. It's just been very easy um, as far as billing, as far as uploading new compensation for folks. Um, and that really provides a big difference for the participant, just being able to upload their compensation so they can leave with a loaded card and not have to wait, not have to have access to a bank account, not have to have access to a computer or phone. Like we can do that for them within minutes, send them home with a card that they can even get cash out. That makes like a huge like variety of barriers just disappear. And it's definitely a great incentive for our wide range of participants with various um, backgrounds and day to day. Um, and because of that, I, I feel like once they're incentivized by these, you know, Kind of barrier-free compensations they once they're in our our building they have access to all these other um uh, all this other all these other services so they're not only promoting our clinical research um but they have access to healthcare and social services that might have been overwhelming to try to find resources for otherwise so i just wanted to say thank you to everyone here for helping with that. That. Turning over to you guys. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Samir. Um, just kind of going off of what you just described and, and both of what you uh, said with the use of ClinCard, but the day to day functions of Fenway Health and whatnot. You know, you have a lot of different um, groups that you have to deal with, you know, socioeconomic, yeah, different backgrounds, different stigmas to deal with. So, with that being said, you know, you, you kind of hit the, um, you know, one of the points on the head with utilizing ClinCard to kind of bring in various populations without having a bank account and whatnot. Are there other unique approaches that you might take to recruit participants for various types of trials? Is, uh, so any other types of approaches aside from perhaps the ClinCard that you would take to recruit patients? Yeah, so it kind of depends on the study itself and what the ask is. So um, we use like for our recruitment and retention purposes, we've got uh, a director of recruitment and retention here, and we've talked about the different modalities in which we get patients. Um, our, our uniqueness in our clinic and kind of the, our EMR has been to internally recruit first because we have like screening abilities. So when a patient comes in, so this is, there's buckets, right? So for Fenway Medical, 
um, when a patient comes in, they fill out a, a survey on you. The survey asks questions like um, uh, economic insecurities, housing insecurity, food insecurity, domestic violence, depression, anxiety. And there's one question which says, are you okay with the Fenway research reaching out to you for possible studies you may be eligible for? And if they say yes, we're allowed to pull a report based off not going to their chart and looking at all the notes, but looking at just their demographics, who they are, how they identify, and what their problem list is. And that's it. We can't look at any, we're not allowed to look at anything else without like a medical like disclosure letter, um, a LOR, release of information. Um, so uh, having said that, we get reports sometimes and we will internally also recruit. The other modalities we use are all passive and what I call active recruitment, which is targeted to certain people. Passive recruitment inclu includes using things like Grindr, Scruff, dating profiles, bus advertisement, news advertisement, Boston Globe advertisement, et cetera, the list goes on. Um, and those are more targeted things that we do depending on what the study asks for. Um, so those are kind of like our different ways. And we also have, uh, People go out into the community, go to like groups and associations, pride events, marches, you name it. They will find they will find a desk and put stuff on and get people to sign up. Uh, so that's like the few ways in which we recruit. We've also done research in the ways we've used social media, specifically hookup sites, and how that's helped us. And like a referral method, where if one person comes from Grinder or another site where they're not actually a patient at Fenway, they're able to be incentivized to find other people to come into study work. So. Um, that has been stuff we've used in the past, mostly for behavioral stuff, not for like uh, investigative product stuff. Is there any outreach? Because I know Boston's a huge college city. I mean, there's about 50 at least yeah. within you know city center. Any outreach to the local universities for patient recruitment? Because I know, I mean, a lot of these, you know, the dating apps you're talking about are LGBTQIA plus yeah. focused, whereas like you said, you're a community health center. So it goes beyond the LGBTQIA. Totally. Community. And I didn't mention this, but Fenway Clinic Healthcare uh, Community Center was actually a Northeastern clinic. It was a college student clinic, student run clinic before it became Fenway Health and then broke off. And now it's actually affiliated with Harvard Medical School peripherally and with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Hospital peripherally. Um, so the history is ingrained, like college has been ingrained in our history. However, you know, like I said, it kind of depends on the study. The most recent example I can draw is we had a college COVID study, which was, I want to say this must have been spring of 21. So we had just had vaccine rollout at that point. And they were looking for people that did not qualify for the vaccine yet. Now everyone gets it. But people that did not qualify, we were looking for young adolescents to receive it or delay getting it, um, and then swabbing people to see what the prevention was and transmissibility of COVID. Once it became readily available, it was unethical for us to tell people to hold off, so we couldn't do that study anymore. And kind of like the PI took that back and we revisited. But um, so yes, we have done outreach where we picketed as much as we could and gone to college campuses, but COVID has made that interesting too, because a lot of our college students were also remote or not here in person. So since I've been in this role, I haven't had a good opportunity to use the college student body and like that access, but we've done it before. Um, community outreach has like a running template of organizations, including like some of the LGBTQI centered uh, sports groups like Stonewall Sports, Pride Sports, as well as the bars, clubs, and um, the college campuses. So this information is centralized now, but uh, and we have used it historically, but it kind of depends on who we're trying to target. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. So we were just previously talking about ClinCard and like how easy it is to use. Sarah or, or Dr. Timur, if you have any input, um, would you guys be able to talk about how technology has played a, a role in reducing the overall workload within the clinical research operations there at Fenway? Sarah, do you want to chime in and then I can kind of flush this one out? Yeah, absolutely. So previously we've had, um, you know, other forms of payment method like Amazon gift cards or checks. Um, and that really did raise a lot of barriers, right? Like uh, as far as checks go, folks need to take that somewhere else. Um, gift cards, they will need a computer to even access that or like it's just not a type of compensation that's interesting to them um, or something that they can use. Um, so just the fact that the clean card 
um, that you offer can be set up so quickly and can be used for cash um, is really, really huge. And the use of like the fact that I can, or anyway, can centralize that to one location despite our four locations and, you know, and plus, you know, remote appointments and everything like that. But I can easily do those compensations and help participants despite being miles away. It's incredibly helpful and time-saving um, to us and our participants. Thanks, Sarah. It's, I can't emphasize what Sarah said enough, like streamlining anything in the research world, please sign us up because the amount of uh, tedious work and administrative work and QCing and queuing and double checking, and it's already enough as it is. So it's, I'm gonna go on a soapbox for a little bit, which is to say that, you know, during COVID there was all this conversation about warp speed and uh, the research being too fast. Um, and yes, for someone who doesn't understand like the progress, the stepwise way in which research happens, I can see, understand that completely. However, no shortcuts were really made. What happened during warp speed was like people overlap steps, whereas opposed to, you know, you would start animal studies and then do phase one, phase two, phase three, FDA approval, and then produce. They just kind of scrunched the layers up and had them overlap ever so slightly. So it's not that the layers themselves were shortened or the steps were shortened. It was just that while animal studies were happening, they were starting up a couple other steps. And then so there was a little bit of overlap as they went through. But at the end of it, the end of the FDA emergency use authorization, a lot of the safety things, all the safety things were done at one point. Just to emphasize the fact that there's so much in research that happens that anything that makes our life easier, please send us up. Um, you know, we do research on technology as well. So we've got a study here looking at prep at home, which is essentially trying to cut back the middleman, which is the doctor visit. And how do we make that shorter and more streamlined? So the way it's a study we're doing with Emory, looking at telehealth, Basically, if you've seen these advertisements online, like Keeps or Hims, trying to obtain one drug for one reason type of deal, um, that is safe and efficacious. So uh, for PrEP, we try to send uh, like a point of care testing kit to people's homes and they self swab and self prick their finger and send it back. And the, we call them as a doctor visit, which lasts like five minutes and they get the refill and that's it. It does not require driving to a doctor's office, having uncomfortable conversations around sex and sexual practices, waiting for your results anxiously, having a conversation about those and then waiting for your refill. It is the goal is, ultimately the goal is for technology to kind of streamline things so that as science advances, we can kind of move things more efficiently along the way. Since I've graduated med school, which was not that long ago, there's already been so much change. And so, the, the practice in which we keep that to be more efficient and user friendly for patients is equally important. So clean card falls into that, you know, that kind of genre of things that are helping us move along quickly. Um, what else was I going to say? There's some stuff you just can't make electronic right now, at least like the fact that we have to have paper charts that are kept in a physical cabinet and the off chance that something goes wrong, that will always stay. So everything else, it's we welcome any kind of new advances. Couple of questions in the in the question box here. Do the sponsor companies that you work with talk about the need for diversity? One hundred percent, which is why we get studies here specifically. Um, that um, research is only as applicable as the participants you have in the study. So if I did a study looking at just white cis gay men who have sex with other men for an HIV prevention. I, as a practitioner, medicine practitioner, can't take that data and be like, oh yes, this black trans woman who has transactional sex for work, uh, I can give her the same medication. I just can't do that. It's unethical for me to take that information and apply it to other people. And so when you're looking at the data, especially around HIV prevention, a lot of the numbers of increased incidents are looking at black uh, trans persons and black men who have sex with men in the South specifically, right? So how do I use a study like I, um, the initial prep studies and kind of translate that to that entire demographic, right? I can't, it's not, it's not feasible. So it's important for diversity to exist. And it's also the incentive for a pharmaceutical company to be able to make the data as applicable to as many people as possible. So 
right now, actually the one study we're doing with Gilead, it's a series of what they're calling the purpose studies. Um, uh, we're in the first, we're one of the first studies, um, we're enrolled as one of the first studies uh, for this one drug called lemcaprevir, which is essentially a subcutaneous or just underneath the skin injection of an antiviral that looks at PrEP every six months. So like instead of taking a pill every day, you just get this little injection right underneath the skin and takes care of that. Um, and so for us specifically, it is a phase two study looking at our trans population and how it um, affects their hormonal uh, hormone uh, gender affirming care, basically, uh, hormone replacement therapy. So, you know, a lot of these patients use uh, estrogen, testosterone, which is injected into the submucosa. And for preventive drug, for something to prevent some other disease, you don't want it to affect the thing they're using for treatment right now, right? Because the treatment takes precedent over prevention. So for a lot of these persons, like we have to be really cautious not to cause mistrust or issues with the drugs they're already getting. So for someone who uses their skin to inject hormones, we have to be careful. Like, are we, uh, is it even a good idea to be injected something subcutaneously for prevention of HIV, right? And so in order to gain the trust of the community, we have to show that we do research in that community as well. There's already enough mistrust as there is with any kind of like science that's out there, especially in the wake of COVID, that um, the more buy-in we get from stakeholders, the better off we're all, all gonna be, all parties involved. Is it trickier? Yeah, it's trickier, but I think Fenway is well-versed in position in a place where they have a level of trust and engagement with that community where they don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. So um, is diversity important research? 100%. Thank you. There's a couple other questions. Uh, in keeping with making things more efficient, do you do any trend analysis on the success of studies in terms of patient retention versus study design that is reduced or added burden to patients? That is an amazing question. I love that question. So yes, we have, uh, we have um, some of our data project managers keeping retention percentages available. And it is, a, it is a big deal. So when we apply for any new study, we have to show what our recruitment and retention numbers look like. So if a pharmaceutical company or a grant is going to put us under the ringer and give us all this onboarding and training, they want to know that they're getting the biggest bang for their buck as well. So part of that is showing retention numbers. And we do have that data. We don't necessarily trend it out amongst all the studies because every study is a little different in terms of its size and scope. So it's hard to kind of generalize those trends. Um, but overall, we look to see a large retention percentage. You know, uh, without stigmatizing any specific group in general, there are certain groups that are harder to retain than others. And I think about persons living with any kind of mental health disorders who are poorly managed and controlled having poor retention compared to some other studies where we're looking for healthier patients, i.e. our phase one studies. So it's hard to kind of generalize those numbers across the board. Um, but we do use that information as like a PR pitch to come do research with us because we're a scrappy little community center that has a long history in this kind of work. Um, what was the second part of that question? I missed the second part. Success of studies in terms of patient retention versus study design, reduced or added burden to patients. Oh, the, 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 the part about the burden to patients. So um, I'm not sure how those two connect, but I will say that given the fact that we've got this special patient population and connection to the community. The one thing we are very careful about that we're trying to address more now than ever is not having co-enrollments in multiple studies, not overburdening our patients with all these messages about research. It's important to be effective and not to like turn people off from the work that we do rather to keep them engaged fully. I'm not sure if I uh, answered the second part of that question well, so if you could rephrase that, whoever submitted that, feel free. Before we jump back to the panel, Tamar, there's uh, a question here. Is there greater reluctance in the LGBTQIA plus community to join a clinical trial? Compared to general population, I would say yes. Um, compared to our Black population, I would say no. But again, that's just me shooting from the hip based off of historical things that have happened. Um, and so... Uh, overall, I think given the advent of the antivirals after, I would say, like the mid-90s into the early 2000s and the advent of PrEP, there's been more buy-in from the LGBTQI 
population, um, whereas there's some more historical trauma with some of our race-based um, uh, patient populations, which is gonna take a lot of time to undo, honestly speaking, that's speaking for the entire country, um, not Fenway specifically. Um, but that's kind of just based off of my experience and what my understanding is of the history of research in the US. Um, but personally speaking, I think we do a pretty decent job. If there is a need to have more black or Latinx participants in a city, we're able to recruit those without any big hurdles. Um, but we also have a pretty diverse staff that does a lot of outreach too. So for example, for our trans study, the purpose one that I just mentioned, we have uh, representation from uh, some of our data team and BSRP team to help recruit for that who identify as trans. And so they know the community well and their needs well. And we also have uh, something called CABs, which are community advisory boards, which are actually required for some of our HIV studies. And that is, the NIH gives us money as, as well as an expectation to have a group of stakeholders within the community there who identify as LGBTQI plus or have HIV risk or are experts in the field to meet to discuss how we're doing research. And so they kind of guide us and make sure that our, our policies are uh, and our ways of uh, getting the community to engage are appropriate, that they're not belittling, that they're cooperative, essentially. So we do kind of that work through our community and outreach program. Well, one more question. Do you use any other patient facing software to support patients and your work or research at Fenway? Sarah, take this one on. I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't Ooh, think of another. I was one. thinking WellSky. That was like my only thought. Oh, WellSky, yeah, for scheduling and um, rescheduling, things like that hold our demographic information. Um, yeah, clean cards are a big one. Clean cards a big one. For like scheduling and messaging, we use WellSky. Um, in medical, we are about to get Epic, thank God, uh, at the end of this year. So we're excited about that. We've been using CPS and we've got a bunch of other small vendors that help with our portal, patient portal and things like that. But in terms of research, it's mostly ClinCard and WellSky. Those are our two big ones. And then obviously there's like study specific stuff. For example, for the prep at home, there's a Emory created a dashboard that is completely separate for that study. Um, and then for our digital prep, there are the RF diary navigating software that's completely separate. So every study kind of brings their own little thing with them as a vendor that they use for their study. But um, overall across TFI, those are the only two that I can think of. And this question dovetails kind of nicely off of that one. What do you wish sponsor companies knew about what sites need today for effective patient recruit recruitment? They ask, <laughs> they usually will ask. So when I get like um, a solicitation form, it will ask, how do you currently recruit? What hurdles do you see and how can we best help you? Um, so those are all part of the package that come when we first apply for our study. Um, you know, there's some stuff we can um, see in advance happening, and there's stuff that just always comes up in the process of enrolling participants. Um, for example, for the COVID vaccine study, a lot of people were traveling or leaving home or leaving college, and so it's hard to retain for that because they'd go across borders or change states, the change states, yep. and so we'd have to like give them off to another site, and that was kind of tricky. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's the, we usually are able to have a, like a very honest, open discussion, at least for the pharma studies. For the network studies, they uh, look at kind of the history and the pedigree and also like the, the track record of the clinic prior to agreeing to the study. So that's where like our performance really does matter. Um, but for the pharma studies, they, they have a little bit more leniency in looking at where you're planning on going next. Great. There's a question here about, will Fenway be anticipating utilization of decentralized clinical trial tools? Decentralized clinical trial tools, for example. So we do use a lot of decentralized tools for, uh, like we'll use other people's IRBs for studies if they require it. Um, we will use other people's labs for studies if they require it. So I'm curious what that question kind of is asking more about. Maybe for clean card for reimbursement, we definitely will keep it centralized though. Is there um, any type of um, kind of patient reported outcomes? I'm, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about with decentralized approach. Uh, 
you mentioned that you would send kits out for people to test themselves. To yes. Have a oh, yeah. and I, there's some clarification here with yes, remote yes. vital signs, electric diaries, that type of information. Yes. So electric diaries, we definitely do use. We use um, for a lot of our studies, um, especially our phase one and two studies, there's a lot of like uh, diary work and qualitative work that the patients um, get on their own, actually for the phase three too. So for our vaccine studies, they were given rulers and told to measure kind of their uh, injection site reactions, how big they were and report that. Um, we're starting to also utilize some mobile <laughs> healthcare units and nurses for some of our studies as well for injectable cabotegravir as PrEP, which is an injection once every two months. Um, well, I'm part of an imp implementation science study looking at how to most effectively get that into the community. Um, so part of that is using additional vendors and resources that aren't just in the clinic. A lot of stuff um, is easy to decentralize or get out into the hands of our patients and users, but there's uh, there needs to be a slight stepwise progression. It's hard to test for three things at the same time. So testing, uh, testing a drug, testing the outcome, testing like the approach in which it was delivered. So that is kind of the slowness with which, um, slow listness of, with which like research happens and implementation happens. Um, but uh, Fauci recently spoke about this too. And he was saying like, implementation science is not just the touchy feely part of medicine. It is equally important now as to doing something at a bench with an animal study. Like learning how people use drugs and prevention methods is just as important as doing a clinical trial to see if it even works. Because at the end of the day, the science is only as good as the people using it. And so if we just say and publish all this new information, if we don't know how people will best utilize that, we're doing a disservice to the, the community. So the goal is to decentralize as much safely as we can, but that's where implementation science comes in. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of a question that comes up and you've already addressed you know, quite a few times and it's you know, regarding any types of bar barriers that exist, if any, right? To conducting a clean, clean, uh, clinical research mission. We've already talked about stigma. We've already talked about trauma, you know, even historical trauma from you know, back, back in the AIDS pandemic and, and prevention the rise of you know drugs like PrEP and kind of more of the education on PrEP and what that is, removing some of that stigma. Are there any barriers that we may have not have mentioned or just the biggest barrier to what you try to do with your clinical research? I know it's a very broad question, especially because like you said, every trial kind of requires something different, but off the top of your head, would you say it's lack of education or the lack of the ability to you know, access that you know, type of information on that clinical trial or even just overall the, the, the drugs that you know, Fenway does stuff with? Really good question. I'm trying to think of all my studies and what would answer that best. You know, people, they're only going to hear about these studies if it's the way we get the information out about the studies, I feel like is the like the biggest barrier. We are, I mean, we don't have like a huge budget. We're not private, we're not for profit. And so we make do with what we have. And part of that is limits how much recruitment effort we're able to put out there. So, you know, we do, we do not claim to have every trans patient in Boston. We just don't, right? So the, we are limited in our scope by our size and our funding, that has, how we get that information out there. Um, I would say we're really careful about how we use language in our recruitment, like really careful. We push back to pharmaceuticals and network studies all the time with their wording, like if they use pronouns or use wordage that is against our mission statement and our work. So I don't feel like the barrier is the way we put ourselves out there all the time. And we do get a lot of feedback from stakeholders and we try to keep language simple and accessible to anyone with any kind of educational level. Um, so I think it's like how far it reaches. Um, that is kind of like the biggest barrier I can think of. On the off, the, the other end of that coin is when we get people in, um, I personally have to be very careful about where to draw the line between being a research site and providing their care. A lot of patients do come to us and they become very comfortable with us talking about their sexual health and their, all their other issues that they will commonly, when they come in for visits, like, hey, how did your injection go? They'll be like, good, but let me tell you about my homelessness or let me tell you about this. And that's not like the thing we're addressing. So we do feel like we've got one arm tied behind our back a little bit with getting them all the care they need 
and they're just they just talk to us so openly and readily that they're even though we will direct them to medical or the other departments of Fenway, they have a reluctance to do that because their rapport with us is so good and longstanding. Um, that's not a barrier, but it's a thing that we're trying to be very careful of. And actually, uh, I don't know if this is sharing too much. We have every other Wednesday, uh, Abby, who's uh, MD and Director of Behavioral Health at Mass General, she comes and does what's called group supervision with our team. And it's for people that are participant facing, uh, talking about kind of the difficulties of managing patients and all their concerns at the same time. So it's like a debrief to kind of process that that experience with a licensed uh, specialist. So um, that is kind of like not a barrier, but it's a thing we're really cognizant of with our patient population. Awesome. Um, one last question before we hit time. I know it. Tr I know time goes by so quickly. We love when the audience is engaged and they ask questions because that makes our lives a lot easier. But also we can spread. You know, we know that they're listening and we can get those questions out that everyone actually really wants to know the answer to. So another big area of focus has been trust. So how has Fenway been able to build trust between the providers and the patients? And like, what are some of those key factors that you have implemented to be able to build trust and keep trust within that community, especially with, like you said, there's some transfers and they may not necessarily want to, um, you know, change their providers. Trust is really hard. Trust is really hard and trust is affected by so much. It's affected by like our outside feelings and emotions and how we, what we bring to the situation as well as kind of all the internal like dynamics and things going on. The last year has been, last three years have been really tricky but overall the goal for trust, especially with research, how it communicates to medical and then to our patients has been communication. For research, when I was brought on, one that was one of the biggest things was that we were not having an easy linear way of getting the word on how research studies were being conveyed to providers, which were being conveyed to patients. So because of the, uh, Fenway has had a lot of growing pains and they re like before pandemic, the year before they saw a huge uptake in the number of patients they had. And with that came the burden on the providers on being up to date on both the amount of work as also the science and the research work. So I, when I first started, I was doing uh, these updates to the medical center with like, hey, these are all the studies we have. These are all the people, eligibility criteria, exclusion criteria, compensation, incentive. This is what it looks like. And I have a field of questions. Um, and we tried to streamline that as much as possible. So now we've hired more staff in the research world that are have one foot in the medical world and one foot in the research world. That's one, just having overlap and kind of like... Um, the burden of work and kind of experience and knowledge. Number two has been uh, figuring out streamlined ways to get the patient directly, the information directly to patients. So there was that survey that I mentioned. Instead of our, our previous way of being able to contact a patient was a research coordinator would have to message the PCP if it was okay for them to call the patient if they had a good enough rapport with the patient. It was kind of like consent by proxy through the PCP. That was what our standard operating procedure was. And that time for our primary care provider to think about a patient, be like, oh yeah, they're good, email us back. And then for us to reach out was, was a lot of work. So now we go straight to the patient. Um, it's been using the appropriate language of our patients. So it's easy to get turned off by seeing a flyer for prep and seeing just a white gay man on it and being like, all right, that doesn't apply. So being really particular about the way we use communications and flyers and advertisements to kind of gain trust in our patient population, participant population. So it requires a lot of work. And the way we actually, the way we learned about the flyer reading wrong for one of our studies was because our CAB, our community advisory board called us out on it. They said, this flyer is not inclusive enough. We get turned off when we see this. Or on the flip side, there was a bunch of flyers with just black gay men on it. And they're like, why am I different? show a diversity of people on it. Why are you just targeting me? That was advice that we got from our cat about the way we would advertise them. So it's easy for us as scientists, as administrators to get bogged down and like the, let's get this thing going and get the ball rolling without actually getting buy-in or kind of advice and feedback from our community. So that's kind of like the way we build trust is like getting as many voices in the room as possible. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Timur. Tamor and Sarah for your time today and speaking with us. We really enjoyed this engaging conversation today. 
um, please feel free to reach out and continue the conversation. Um, we have Dr. Tamor's information here as far and along with um, Fenway's website. So you can read more about their mission on their website. Uh, please feel free to check out some of our Green Fire Thought Leadership initiatives. Um, please um, check out some of our blogs that we've wrote, some of our interviews with Black Women Clinical Research, Latinos in Clinical Research, like My Fire Women's Empowerment event. And then we're so excited to be able to add this to our list as well. Um, and we're, we will be at um, DIA. We'll have a session on advancing diversity and equity and inclusion across the life sciences R&D meeting. And that is October the 6th. So please feel free to register for that. And if you're interested more in our solutions, just um, we have solutions that help remove barriers um, from patients. ClinCard is a patient reimbursement and stipend solution. We have an integration with Lyft, which is the leading rideshare um, platform and connects our, lead, our leading global patient concierge service for clinical trial travel globally. We thank you so much for your time today, and it's been a pleasure to speak with you all. And please reach out and connect, follow us on LinkedIn, and we'll look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Well.